Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Stu. Yeah, I, I don't know. As long as the sound is good, I guess I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I've got one mic in my webcam, but uh, should be picking that one up. Anyway, okay, so we're going to talk today about facilitation a little bit. Um, uh, just actually completed a, a course with with Stu, HRDNZ, on facilitation, so um, I'm going to use material from that. Uh, and feel free to jump in at any point um, and add your thoughts and comments. I'll, uh, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, okay. Um, so what we're we going to talk about, we're going to have a look at um, these things here. Um, in particular, we're going to concentrate on the five-stage model that you, you might have seen before. Um, I'll talk a bit about planning. I'll talk a bit about uh, uh, motivating people and organizing people online. A little bit about working in forums and uh, design and uh, management of, of group work. But that's not the main focus of, of this presentation. We, we could do more on that. I wasn't quite sure if the audience would be mainly people who are presenting online or people who are designing for online, uh, but most of these things should uh, apply to both people. Uh, if you're a designer, um, then you have a role in making things easier for the facilitator uh, by providing uh, these things here, clear instructions, navigation, and uh, uh, formative uh, activities with clear feedback, so practice activities. Designers these days tend to concentrate more on activities than content, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, as a facilitator, you'll want to have a look at any feedback you've got from previous courses, any evaluations, any experiences that other people have on running similar courses. Um, and then before you actually start the course, you'll, you'll want to welcome users in uh, and you want to test your course. I've put here link checking, but I guess that's just a placeholder for um, making sure everything works uh, before you start the course because um, you don't want to suddenly find a technical issue after the course has started. Um, you'll be doing some plans and possibly the most important uh, plan you'll be doing. Sorry. Look over here. Two screens running. Um, You'll need to consider um, usability and uh, user friendliness. I think uh, Joyce talked at length about those things this morning. Um, and uh, I'm just going to bring up a quote here. So while you're reading that, um, these two common assumptions are quite, uh, are quite common, uh, perhaps less common than they used to be. Um, yeah teaching online and teaching face-to-face -face are not the same thing at all. And if you've tried both, you will know that probably. Um, okay, so um, uh, yeah, the second assumption is that, yeah, that it's about technology. So uh, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to manage two screens here. Um, so, okay, so one of the things you'll want to have a look is at the communications plan. Um, sorry, my, there we go, uh, before the course starts. So um, that'll help you what, remember what you have to do and when you have to do it. And you probably don't want to use a, a generic one you probably want to design and modify one for uh, each course that you do. Uh, so here's a, a course that we, we ran recently, and here's just the beginning of the communications plan um, uh, for, for that course. So it just tells me, if I'm the facilitator, what it is I'm doing uh, before the course starts, when the course starts, uh, following up with learners, and then what I'm doing every day uh, and so on. So, um, and here you can find uh, some advice on creating communications plans that are not uh, specific to uh, facilitating online courses, but uh, it's um, more about uh, uh, organizations, but there's a lot of useful hints and tips in there. 
so you should be able to link to that one. Um, I've put the presentation in the course area, so you can uh, you can download it and have access to all of the URLs that are here. All right, so that's one of the first things that you want to do is make sure you make sure you've uh, planned your communication with your users. Probably the most important thing that you need to do before the course starts. Um, if you haven't had a hand in the design of the course, uh, I guess it becomes more important for you to, to 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 know what it is you're going to do and when you're going to do it because it may not have been designed in exactly the way that. Uh, that you would have designed it. So um, inside the communications plan, you can also note things like you need to do, like if I designed this, I would have explained X, Y, Z to the user. So put it in your comms plan so you can post it in the forum um, and run it, if you like, your way. Thanks, Aaron, good to see you. Um, okay, so we're gonna have a look at a model. Um, and the model I'm going to use is pretty, uh, pretty well known, um, uh, Julie Salmon's model, and it's a good one, particularly when you're beginning, because it's um, it's a time-based model, so it's a series of scaffolding uh, steps. So starting here at the bottom, so the things you're doing when you first to get onto a course are these things here. You're providing access and, and motivation. And then as the course goes on, you're getting into some of these other areas here. So it helps us develop a plan. Um, it, it also shows how the facilitator role, facilitator role changes over the period of a course, because again, um, as, the, as uh, Mary Bart said earlier on, it's not like teaching face-to-face. -face. Um, it is different, and you do need to take on different roles as the course develops. And hopefully, if if that's going well, you'll find that you're up as you get up towards these latter stages, uh, your participants are less and less dependent on you, and more engaged with each other. That's the that's the general aim of an online course, uh, in most cases, unless of course it's a short training course, and even then, hopefully they have time to develop some social skills, some social engagement. Um, it also tells us, I guess, that uh, group work would probably more, be more effective in the later stages of the course than in the earlier stages. Uh, while people are getting used to the course, it's probably not a good idea to load uh, teams and groups and a whole load of other stuff, layer that on top of, uh, on top of the course when they're just trying to get to grips with it. So I think um, I think you can see what you might call the heavy lifting is going to be done up here at these later stages of the course. And this bar here is actually trying to is actually trying to show that that's the amount of interactivity that you would expect between participants in the course. So low here and higher as we get up here. So uh, that's what Julie Salmon is trying to tell us. Uh, and the implication there for group work is is quite plain, I guess. Um, okay, so at the beginning, we need to set up a welcoming environment, uh, and we also need to be prepared to, to give lots of technical support where necessary. Again, technical support is something that you, you probably wouldn't do in a face-to-face -face course that much, um, but you're definitely going to have to do it online. So you're going to have to know, you're going to have to know your LMS, in this case Moodle, quite well in order to be an effective facilitator. Uh, and at the very least, you're gonna to have to know where you can quickly run and get help um, yourself if you need it. Planning, of course, as we saw, it always helps your organization if you've thought about things in advance. And again, um, if we go back to what Joyce and uh, uh, Jess were saying this morning, Jess, was it? Um, it it's uh, it designing, um, designing user experience is quite good quite important. Um, so at this stage, one of the things that will help greatly are icebreakers. I think probably everybody knows about icebreakers by now. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, they can be simple and as long as they have the aim of getting people together and building some kind of sense of community. So um, 
there's different thoughts on icebreakers uh, and how they promote early engagement. Um, a social element is important, um, preferably a fun social element. Um, and uh, of course, a positive tone. Uh, you will be modeling to your participants. So you'll need, uh, you'll need to model to them in the way that you want them to behave. So um, you can have activities that are uh, completely unrelated to the course material. People like to do things like, what if you're stranded on a desert island? What's your favorite food, color, music? If you had a magic wand and so on, which can promote the fun element. People get pretty creative with that sort of thing. Um, I quite like to introduce some kind of um, question about expectations so I can try and discover right at the beginning what it is that the participants are accepting from the course. Um, that can obviously help you make your course, um, yeah, um, um, make your courses um, more interesting and more effective by finding out what it is that pe people want from you can't always deliver it, but uh, if you know what they want, you can do as much as you can. Uh, two truths and a lie. Yeah, I like that one, Aaron. I used that one recently. And uh, yeah, it's quite good. Um, so, um, but I, I don't know if we really want to go into an explanation, but briefly, Aaron's two truths and a lie. Uh, you tell two truths about yourself and one lie, and then the other participants have to guess which one is the lie. And you can you could do that quite nicely in a Moodle wiki and uh, keep score um, if you set up the frame in a spreadsheet like excel and then cut and paste that into a wiki it's quite easy to keep keep the scores updated it's quite fun um, i often feel that relating it to the content is not a bad approach i mean it depends um, i guess it depends on the nature of your course um, so I quite often relate it to the content. So if we're doing a workshop on facilitation, you know, what's your worst experience delivering, uh, delivering to a workshop, uh, and that can get quite fun as well, because there are <laughs> quite a mix of experiences of delivering stuff out there, uh, and some interesting horror stories. So <clears throat> what kind of icebreaker you choose, just uh, think about it, be quite good. Uh, and there are plenty on the web, of course. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Quite right, Tabitha. Yep. Uh, if if uh, if if it relates to the experience of your students and you find out what prior knowledge they've got, that's good as well. Um, now, uh, for stage two, uh, Julie, someone uses the term bridge building, which is what this is this is all about. So you'll still want to be quite highly available and making it clear that students can contact you in a fully online um, an asynchronous course you want to discourage the notion that you never sleep so um, you probably want to make it clear that there might be a little bit of delay uh, perhaps as long as 24 hours before you can give um, uh, your participants a response and that also depends on um, where your where your learners are, if they're in the same country, or as in many workshops I've run, um, scattered across the globe. Uh, okay, uh, uh, group activities are, can start to come in here. So uh, build relationships with our learners. Um, I don't think uh, you should feel the need to control these type of activities um, too much, and certainly you should. Um, establish uh, conversations and you certainly have something to say but you want to begin already the the stepping back process you don't want to be too intrusive particularly if conversations are going on um, between participants um, i think constant corrections uh, and so on and uh, comments on student input can be quite annoying and demotivating if overdone so if you are a little bit of a control freak or you have that in your nature, then you want to think about that and you want to think about not always perhaps being the center of attention, particularly as the course goes on, um, which is probably hard for the average teacher, uh, as, I, as I well know. We, like, we do like to hear a control enthusiast. I love it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I've seen that one before. But I think all teachers 
have a bit of that uh, in them kind of goes with the territory when you when you have a lively class uh, now okay but stage three um, so we've established uh, established our community we've built some bridges there's a sense of trust hopefully if there's not a sense of trust you're, you're probably losing them already um, most of the learners uh, should be engaged interacting and communicating doesn't mean that no support is necessary but by now you'll have a feel for individuals and where they're at um, you'll know who the ones are that are flying through the material and doing well and going streets ahead and you'll also probably have identified some that are a little bit unsure um, if you get a great tool to use here i think i've probably got it on the next slide is to use the moodle's built-in reports to to try and get a feel for who's done what or who's doing what uh, and particularly some of um, the uh, configurable reports that we saw from Elizabeth this morning, if you're at that presentation, they would be very powerful at this particular stage. Uh, so you might be providing um, a sense of purpose. You might be organizing learners into groups at this point. You'd certainly be providing uh, clarity around the tasks that you've set. So um, you might at this stage be sending private messages. Um, to people that don't appear to be engaged with the material or appear to be struggling or perhaps haven't even signed on yet. If they haven't signed on at stage three, you are likely losing them. But, okay, you can still send them an email and say, are you aware that, you know, you're getting a little bit behind? And, of course, you want to do that um, via email rather than <laughs> publicly shame them. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um you might also, for some of those learners, you might need to summarize the course uh, events for them and let them, know, let them know which deadlines they absolutely have to meet if they're going to succeed in the course. And uh, of course, there are tactful ways of getting that information across with, uh, with adult learners. Uh, so as an example, there, Moodle provides uh, heaps of um, activity reports. Uh, and or um, reports, course reports, as well as the configurable reports, and these will these will show you how people are how people are doing. So if you haven't seen this one before, the rows are the participants. So and these are the activities that people are supposed to have undertaken. Some of them are marked by the system, and you have pass marks, and some of them are uh, marked by the um, could be marked by the user but at least you'll see uh, who's done what or who's missing anything or who's uh, got completely lost. Uh, so that will, that will be really, really important. Um, okay. Um, so um, if the course has been well designed and it's being well facilitated, which it is because you're doing it, um, then you've got your learning community established uh, and participants are working together on tasks. Um, you might just need to do a little bit of maintenance at this stage. Um, you, uh, you want also to think about the way that your instructions come across to learners. So, for example, uh, you might be uh, tempted to introduce a new forum and uh, you might say, um, I want you to discuss X, Y, Z. Um, unfortunately, that kind of encourages people to post a, a completed viewpoint, a closed viewpoint, if you will. Um, you might be better off making, making that a group activity, particularly in the later middle and later stages of the course. So working in pairs or groups, identify the top three issues, uh, top, top three issues in XYZ would probably be a better way to encourage interaction and in the participants. Um, I, I found the Moodle Wiki is a use case for this, perhaps more than the forum, although Again, it depends on your participants. They may be more used to forums than wikis, so there might be a little bit of a, a pain barrier there. But uh, it's good because uh, users can have both individual 
and group pages in the same key. So once they've, once they've learned to use it, um, it should be okay. So you've got all your kind of organizational detail and then all your all your um, participants' work, it's all in the same place. So you can see here, here, there's a rubric, for example, for this activity. There's a description of the activity here. There are group pages, which would be the product for the activity. And further down here, there would be um, pages for each individual participant to share their thoughts. So um, I think at this stage, it's, not, it's, uh, it's quite a good tool to be able to use. Although, as I say, um, your participants may need to have uh, perhaps an introduction to a more gentle introduction to the wiki before you throw one at them for for um, an assessed task or an important task um, important to them or one they perceive as significant should say so you might want a you might want a smaller activity perhaps in the using the icebreaker to introduce them to the wiki if you think that maybe they haven't seen it before. Um, and then finally, okay, we've got to this nice high point um, where the, the learners are hopefully in control um, and they're, they're, they don't need any support really. They're getting towards the end of the course. They've, they hope, they've just got a few questions left perhaps. Uh, you want to put your assessments and your um, uh, feedback, although um, your major feedback, I should say, because of course it's a good idea to have short feedbacks for each each topic or each stage of your course as well. So starting maybe with quick polls just to see where people that are at where people are at during the course, but towards the end of the course, yeah, you want to you want to have some serious feedback. So. You can get ready for the next one, and you want to. You want some time for people to reflect on what they've learned, absorb what they've learned, and show you, I suppose, and show you that they've actually learned it. Again, it depends on the kind of uh, course that you're running. Um, but yeah, if if it's if there's a certificate involved or some qualification involved, this would be the logical place. Um, the logical place to put that. Right. Um, so, uh, of course, there's no formula yet. There's nothing that can tell us what we need to be doing at every stage. Um, so we still need to be flexible and creative. Uh, we still need to think about uh, what people are going to need. Uh, again, if you're not involved in course design, then some of the aspects uh, can't be implemented by you. Um, careful design of group work. Um, so you might also find the course been designed with a specific learner profile in mind. That doesn't mean that you will have only learners with that profile on your course when it runs. So there isn't any any substitute really for your own flexibility and creativity. So. Uh, like any other learning situation, you do need to be adaptable and you do need to, to recognize um, the learners when the learners aren't getting it. The difference, of course, is online. It's not so easy to determine that um, from the learners as you can by, say, looking around a classroom tutorial or perhaps even a lecture theater um, and noticing that everybody's asleep. You can't really see that online. Okay, uh, so here's, here's another, another thought here um, and another good link for you to, to follow up on uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in finding out more about uh, um, the facilitator's role. A lot of these links you'll find go into what I'm talking about in a great deal more depth. Uh, and uh, Ed Hutstein came up some time ago with this idea that um, the online facilitator wears four different pairs of shoes. Uh, and uh, this probably accounts for the uh, difficulties experienced by those who uh, don't differentiate traditional teaching from online teaching, as uh, we saw Mary Bart um, 
mentioned earlier on in the quote I showed earlier on. Yeah, in traditional lecturing, perhaps you only need to instruct, although that probably also makes for a fairly dull course. Remembering my time at university, I think, um, although that's some time ago, there was a lot of instruction. Perhaps some younger people can tell me if that's changed at university. There wasn't very much social direction, program management, or technical assistance, things that we did. Right. Uh, okay. So to motivate and engage your learners, uh, you do need to know why they're taking the course. Uh, another obvious use for an icebreaker. Were they made to? Um, or did they volunteer? Um, this can obviously have a tremendous effect on the course. If you are unfortunate enough to facilita facilitate a course that people have been forced to take by their employer or other people, it's probably not quite such an enjoyable experience as working with people who've gone, oh, that's an interesting subject. I, I'd like to take that. Um, okay, so try and give them good reasons to participate. Um, Apart from anything else, if they're bored or demotivated, so then they'd probably be negative and uh, they uh, deal with others uh, and uh, basically break up your, your the social interactions you were planning. Of course, in this case, you probably got to take some steps to deal with that privately and try and persuade them that you know for the greater good they need to they need to be a bit more positive. Uh, the group work could obviously be affected by that as well. So it's quite nice to know why your learners are on the course. And again, if you can bring that up in the icebreaker, you might be able to head off some problems and you might be able to provide some reasons why they should be committed to your to, to committed to your course. Uh, you need some good um, formative activities in your course uh, because you want people to enjoy success. So some of those should be um, some of those should be quite uh, comparatively easy, should we say? Um, even your engaged and committed learners who are streets ahead might find might say they found the the, the quiz is too easy, but they won't mind too much, right? Doing something easy and and getting a high grade on it, uh, and your more nervous types will be encouraged by by their success. In, uh, I don't recommend always um, showing quiz results. I mean, again, you have to know your audience, but in some circumstances, uh, a little bit of a competitive element is useful. So a little leaderboard for a quiz uh, can be a good idea. Uh, it can also be a bad idea. So you'll have to just judge your audience as, as best you can. Um, I, I, I noticed that a place where it did work extremely well was in um, a boys' school, um, which was fairly strong on sports. So they were very competitive lads, and they very much were motivated by trying to get the highest scoring quizzes. Um, yes, Stuart. Yes. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, I suppose that's right. Yeah. Um, possibly should put, possibly did put um, what the highest attainable grade was there. Uh, this particular quiz was um, um, Moodle certainty-based marking, which is why you can get more than 100%, um, because it, it, I think it's three times, yeah, it's three times the, the, the score for, for getting it right and being 100% sure that it was right. So you can also get negative scores on this quiz, which is which, is, which <laughs> amuses some participants, but not others. Yeah. So if you were sure you were 100% right, um, but you're actually wrong, and you'll get a negative score. <laughs> anyway, so um, some people find that fun, some people don't. So, but it's just something you can try. And again, you know, if you're going to introduce an activity like this and you're not sure how it's going to go over, then just share with your participants what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if they don't like it, well, you know, don't take too much notice of it. Um, as long as they know why, why you did it, you, you, you're usually okay, even if they didn't like it. Yeah. All right. So... Um, we have lots of different uses for forums. Um, discussions are good, yeah. 
but here are some other suggestions. Um, uh, they're pretty ver versatile. Not every forum has to have um, a lively discussion. Uh, negotiation, you know, testing and modification of synthesis. They don't all have to do that. Um, the purpose, obviously, should be clear. Um, why did you Why did you put it in there? Um, and it, it might be just um, as the news forum is in Moodle, a, a forum for you to communicate with um, the participants. So there are lots and lots of different uh, forums uh, and. Not all skills have to be higher order. Not all for forums have to give rise to uh, huge numbers of debates. So, um, yeah, think about the purpose of your forum. And if you're wondering what it is that you you want to be doing, um, have a look at some of these ideas and follow up on, on some of these too. So um, some of these references too will give you probably a lot more ideas about using forums. Um, just going to base the next slide on, it's actually based on a diff slightly different model. It's quite similar to Julie Salons, actually, um, but one which I looked at before in the, in the context of uh, course development and course progress. Um, so you can, you can you have a set of facilitation strategies here that you can apply if a la uh, Julie Salmon at different stages in the course, but also you can apply them with different ideas and different results in mind. And again, there are lots, there are lots of different ways to organize your forum. So um, if we think about, uh, if we think about round robins, for example, where you ask, um, a user to post and then pose a question for another person to answer that person posts a response and poses a question for another person to answer and so on um, so you know you can you can ring the variations if you will um, and try different things you can introduce yeah, such techniques as having peer facilitation if you've got the time depends how much time you've built into your course so have you know you you it, it, Assuming you're in control and the administ administ administrator of your system lets you, you can allow some of the participants to take part in facilitation too. Uh, and that's not bad. Um, if, if, a, if a participant becomes a facilitator, they have to put a different hat on and, and they take a different view of the course and it can be quite instructive for them. Um, you can think about ratings, particularly once people um, are assumed to be um, further on in the course and having pretty good knowledge of the subject material uh, that's the assumption so yeah we can we can start to use uh, um, we can start to use ratings so uh, I was going to repeat yeah the need to step back but yeah okay that's in there we've done that already uh, there's a, if you don't know um, this technique again of Julie Salon uh, about weaving forums, you you probably need to. If you're running any kind of forum and you're expecting and you're expected at some point to summarize the discussion and give feedback, you'll want to have a look at uh, these references here. I haven't. I'm not going through the whole thing because there are like 13 steps. Um, and they wouldn't all fit neatly on a slide, so we've got the we've got the brief version here. But uh, for example, she suggests cutting and pasting all of the forum contributions into a Word doc and uh, color coding them um, to highlight the main themes, and then looking at those themes um, and responding to those themes or summarizing those themes and remembering to quote from the individuals that wrote them. So. Um, this is this is really really good, and there's a video here as well for those of you that prefer watching to reading. So that'll and that'll um, that, those two sources you'll find very very useful if you have to summarize forums. So to put that put that into practice um, is is a very important part of facilitation. Actually, yeah, rather than responding ad hoc 
to contributions to a forum, like whenever you feel like it or when you woke up in the morning and decided, oh, I haven't facilitated the forum for a while, maybe I should just step in and do something. Perhaps don't. Perhaps step back and get a, get a global view of the whole discussion and, um, and then weave it following, following Chile's uh, recommendations. Uh, next. That's what we got. So, all right. Uh, should you grow forums? Well, you know, up to you, right? So, <laughs> you knew that. Uh, it depends on your objective. Yeah. So, if you're looking for collaboration and cooperation, then don't grade, right? Um, if it's a different way of assigning an assessment task, then probably yes. Um, again, just make it clear to your lunar learners <laughs> what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, so, obviously, it has to be part of your plan for, for grading an assessment. You can't just stick a form in and, you know, then decide that you're going to assess it. Um, you know, if you have a thousand points for your course and there are four forms worth 10 points, um, you haven't got balance, the students might, might suss that out and not bother. Uh, of course, if you reverse that and you allocate 200 points for each student, that, for each forum, the students can do, you know, three forums and pass, right, and then not bother with your formal assessment. So if you do decide to grade forums, just put it in as part of your grading plan and make sure you haven't, uh, you haven't been unreasonable or overloaded the students. So that's just, that's just part of the sensible course approach, really. Not much more to say about that, I guess. Uh, question is a question. Is there a question? Ah, ah, learning to teach online. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I've got. I think I've even got one or maybe one or even two more there, Maureen, uh, referring to that learning to teach online, which is wonderful. Very, very good. Um, uh, okay. Uh, just a bit about group work. Oh no, sorry. Oh. Pass through a slide, okay. Yes, okay, so we've got, um, yeah. If you're going to, you are going to evaluate your course, of course, either you're going to evaluate it or you're going to be told to evaluate it or somebody else is going to evaluate it for you. So uh, here are some things to bear in mind that, that people would probably like to see. If your participants are um, showing this kind of behavior, then your course has been su successful. Are you kidding? Sorry. <laughs> Not now. All right. Now, okay. I knew I meant to turn that off. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, yes. So there we go. So uh, again, here's some, some more links for you to look at, remembering that the presentation is in the course area, so you can download it and try those as you're, as you're um, at your leisure. Okay. Uh, right. Good work. Um, <laughs> do you play well with others? Um, no, not always. Uh, but I do recognize the value of working within a group. So when I'm myself a participant in an online course, I, uh, I do force myself to do it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I like, I'm, like most people do, I like social groups when there are no deliverables and no deadlines to meet and expectations are low. Um, but I'm not so, perhaps not so keen on it when it's a group assignment and my grade to some extent depends on what other people do. Um, but having said that, you know, group work is, is really, really quite useful. Teamwork is quite a good thing to, to get people to, to get into. Um, rubrics, I guess, help, help you. We've got those built into Moodle, so um, do use those. Uh, if you're asking learners to um, submit written assignments, ask them to collect and quote evidence from their own forum posts, okay? So you don't have to do it, all right? So uh, a, group, a group of 10 to 15 participants can generate an awful lot of posts when they're fully engaged. So yeah, so as part as part of um, part of work, group work and general work, yeah, if you can persuade students to to look at their own forum posts and quote from those, that's a great idea. Um, 
I know of a teacher once who, who set up a forum with a really intriguing subject for some, some young lads and uh, set it up on Friday afternoon. And on Monday morning, she came in and she had 220 posts in the forum. So um, that's quite a lot of work. Yeah, um, that's quite, quite a lot of stuff to go through. So getting students to do that for themselves is a, not a bad idea. And organizing them into discussion groups um, would be a great idea. Okay, I'm uh, going to have to hang up again. Just going to call it again. Sorry, that's actually my wife is flying back from New York at the moment. I think she must have landed at LA, so she's probably going to keep calling me. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, now next. Uh, yes, okay, so hopefully you are able <laughs> yeah unfortunately it's a skype phone so it doesn't have a flight mode but yeah, it's a rather awkward so i'll deal with the fallout later for not talking to them okay um designing uh, group work so yeah if it's not been planned well you can find it gives you more work uh, not less work all right so um yeah, it's very, very important to get clear instructions about what learners need to do, uh, why they're doing it, where they're doing it, a clearly defined outcome or product for the group. So pretty essential. <laughs> yes, thank you, Joyce. <laughs> uh, discussion forum or wiki can help learners collaborate, but um, that shouldn't be the actual product. You're better off um, having a different product for, for, for group work. Um, in a recent course uh, that we ran with Stu, um, one of the Moodle Bytes courses, uh, a task was to develop a checklist for facilitation so students can read the material that they need to, um, discuss, the, discuss the different approaches in a wiki, and then the focus is for them to actually produce, um, produce a checklist. Uh, so um, the rubric was designed uh, really to reflect individual contributions uh, that the learners themselves identified, uh, as well as to evaluate the, the group's product as well. Uh, yeah, and again, right, we've got strategies down here that you will want to use to manage your workload. Um, everybody needs to manage their workload. Uh, and I think I can go and deal with the flat here shortly. Thanks, Stu and Joyce, for your helpful suggestions. Uh, and I'd just like to, I'd just like to thank um, Stu for um, the input I got and the feedback I got when uh, when creating the course for facilitators from, from which uh, much of this material was, uh, was in fact taken. So I think I'm about done and ready to take questions if there are, should be any questions about that. I hope that wasn't too fast and furious. I guess I have been talking for 40 minutes. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's still on your website. Send me a new one. Um, questions? Thoughts? I think Don, 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 are we ready to wrap up or is somebody else going to yeah. take questions? Well, while people are formulating their questions, I know they are. Um, we'd just like to thank you very much for your very informative um, presentation. All the nice, useful links you've got there as well will definitely be um, good for us to go back and review some of those notes that you've presented. Uh, thank you very much for being part of the iMoot for 2015. And um, we'll keep the session going just in case the questions will pop in eventually. And we'll see how we go. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, oh, hi, Joyce. Masquerading as Mark. No, Mark masquerading as Joyce. Good. Thanks, Aaron. Um, catch up with you one of these days. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Okay, all right, people are departing. I think I'm going to go and deal with the fallout now. <laughs> Don't 
Thanks, Mark. All right. And uh, yeah, congrats to Joyce on her presentation this morning. I just, before we came into this session, I had a chance to review it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really good. Uh, lots to take in there. <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. All right. See you. I'm going to, I'm going to bug out.